so next we are going to jump into a brand new special monthly feature uh, that, uh, that Rachel and I have named uh, DSP Corner. Uh, so one thing that, um, that Rachel and I were discussing was about how uh, it would be great to have something where we could teach some, some DSP fundamentals and, um, and talk uh, and, and, and help um, talk about some things that aren't talked about very often within audio programming. And, uh, and Rachel's uh, happy to, uh, to give this monthly feature. Uh, and just to tell you a little bit about Rachel, Rachel and I have known each other for a couple of years now. And uh, she's just graduated with a master's in digital audio engineering from the University of West London. And uh, today she's going to talk a little bit about mathematical <laughs> notation. Uh, so yes. Away, <laughs> Thank you, Josh. I'm just gonna get my presentation up and running. Um, very warm welcome to the first episode of my new series, DSP Corner. So I came up with the concept of DSP Corner because I've just recently finished my master's, as Josh said, in digital audio engineering. And a large portion of my master's focused on um, engineering mathematics and specifically DSP mathematics. And coming from a music tech background, I found the resources and textbooks that taught DSP mathematics quite inaccessible to jump into as a new student to this area. So I thought it'd be nice to maybe come up with a series where there's some nice little diagrams and explanations that could uh, lower the barrier to entry for DSP and provide some nice introductions to those concepts. Um, the room I'm in has a refrigerator in and it's just started like a low level hum. So I hope that's not gonna interfere with the video. Maybe next month we can write a comb filter to remove the hum, only joking. <laughs> um, so let's get started. So first off, I'm just gonna give a quick introduction to signals, just make sure we're on the same page regarding continuous time and discrete signals and their notation. So an analog or continuous time signal is a physical quantity that varies in time. In our case, when you're talking about sound, a signal is a function of air pressure over time, time being the continuous medium. When we sample or digitize a signal, we're left with the independent variable n, meaning that now we have only integer points n to represent the amplitudes of our original signal. You can think of this as moving from infinite precision time to finite precision samples. In terms of mathematical notation, you can see in the table at the top of the slide that continuous time, sometimes called analog, is notated with round brackets and the independent variable t. And you can see in discrete time or digital that we use these square brackets and the independent variable n. At the bottom of the screen, I've got plots of a continuous time signal and a discrete time signal. The continuous time signal on the left shows a smooth unbroken sine wave, whilst the discrete time signal on the right shows a sine wave that only has amplitude values for integer samples n. I just noticed that whoever made these plots did not uh, label the axes. I would invite you to always label the axes because this is very important in terms of uh, viewers knowing what the quantities are on either of your axes. But um, for these ones, we would have time as the x-axis on the left graph and samples n as the x-axis on the right graph. Sinusoidal signals are incredibly important when it comes to audio signal processing. We'll see later on in the series that this is because any audio signal can be decomposed into a combination of sinusoidal elements, each with their own frequency and phase information. Let's have a look at some of the measurable properties of sinusoids. The first property I'd like to talk about is period. 
A signal is periodic if it repeats an identical pattern after each period t from minus infinity to plus infinity. The period is the shortest distance between identical points. If you can find no period t larger than zero at which the signal repeats itself, then this is a non-periodic signal. We can see for the sinusoids that when looking at the cosine, at the origin, the value is one. And we see the next time the value is one for the cosine here in blue, the period is two pi. So the distance at which it repeats itself is two pi. And we can see the same thing happen for the sinusoid that starts at zero and at two pi, we have a value of zero. What is the mathematical notation for periodicity? We say a signal is periodic if x of t plus capital T is equal to x of t. So that is to say that if we take a point on our signal x of t and add to it the period capital T, then we will be left with the same value like we just saw. So we've determined that sinusoids are periodic in 2 pi. So we can say that x of t plus 2 pi is equal to x of t. We can also say that sinusoids are 2 pi periodic. The next quantity I'd like to talk about is phase shift. Phase shift describes how much a signal is shifted from the origin. We often express phase shift in terms of the cosine. We'll see why this is done a little bit more when we start looking at rotating phases and the unit circle later on in the series. But for now, we'll measure the phase shift from the cosine because it starts at one at the origin. So if we look at the sinusoid in relation to the cosine, we can see that the peak happens approximately pi over two distance later. So how can we describe the relationship between sine and cosine? We can say that sine is equal to cosine shifted by minus pi over two. Now you might be thinking, why are we saying minus pi over two? It looks like that signal, the red signal is shifted in a forward direction. So shouldn't it be plus pi over two? Well, actually in signal processing, this is what's called a delay because that signal will be reached later than the blue signal. And if you move a signal to the left, that's called an advance. So in this case, we've moved the signal to the right or the sign is shifted to the right of the cosine. So we can call it a delay. That's why it's minus pi over two. If we want to express the phase shift in terms of sine, we could say that cosine it's, is equal to sine plus pi over two. The final quantity I'll mention is amplitude. Amplitude is a scaling factor, which in reality translates to a perceptual loudness of a signal. What does the A represent in amplitude? A signal with amplitude A oscillates between plus A and minus A. So we can see by looking at our sinusoids that they oscillate between plus one and minus one, meaning that our amplitude is one. Another quantity we haven't yet mentioned is frequency. Period and frequency measured in Hertz or cycles per second have an inverse relationship. The inverse relationship is such that frequency is equal to one over the period and period is equal to one over the frequency. In mathematical notation, we represent the frequency with a lowercase f. In mathematical notation, as we saw before, we represent the period with an uppercase t. I'll mention at this point that generally in signal processing, or especially audio signal processing, 
you will reserve lowercase letters for the time domain, which is what we're looking at right now, and uppercase letters for the frequency domain, which we're going to be looking at later on in the series. Uh, the period being capital T is just an exception to this rule that we're going to have to deal with, I'm afraid. But yeah, usually it will be a lowercase for time domain and uppercase for frequency domain. As you can see at the bottom of this page, we've got two sinusoids. The bottom sinusoid is double the frequency of the top sinusoid. And I wanted to show the relationship between frequency and period. So we can see that the sinusoid that is double the frequency has half the period. And we can see that the sinusoid that has half the frequency has double the period. So we can say that a doubling in frequency causes a halving in period, and a halving in frequency causes a doubling in period, showing the inverse relationship between the two. Here we are looking at the general mathematical formula for sinusoidal signals. Sinusoids are characterized by three parameters. These are amplitude, frequency, and phase shift. I've given the formulas for both continuous and discrete time sinusoids. The only real difference is the note in the notation is the brackets and the independent variable. You can see that for the continuous time sinusoid at the top, we have the round brackets and we have the independent variable t denoting time. We can also see in the body of the cosine function, the independent variable t. Down here, we can see that x of n has square brackets denoting a discrete time signal. And again, we see the discrete time independent variable n in the body of the cosine. We're introduced to a new notation here for the frequency. That's because this frequency is expressed in angular frequency. We use the Greek letter omega to represent this, or omega zero. So angular frequency is in radians per second rather than cycles per second. At the top of this page, I've provided some conversions between radian frequency and regular frequency. And we can see that if we times regular frequency by 2 pi, we're given radian frequency. And on the right side of the screen here, I've shown the equivalence between using omega 0 and 2 pi f, just to show that on both sides, those two are completely equivalent. I'd like to bring your attention to a common way of notating signals whilst introducing introducing two types of useful signals in DSP. On the left-hand side of the equation is the notation of the signal we want to express. In this case, we use the Greek letter delta to inform the reader that this is a Dirac delta function, or more well-known by audio folks, this will be called an impulse function. On the right side of the equation, we're given the value of the signal at any value of n. So it says here that the signal is equal to 1 when n is equal to 0, as we can see in the diagram on the right here. And the signal is equal to n, uh, the signal is equal to 0, sorry, when n is not equal to 0. So for all other values of n, the signal is equal to 0. Below that, we have the unit step function. That's denoted with the notation u of n. And we can see for the unit step function that it has a value of 1 for n larger than or equal to 0, and a value of 0 for n smaller than 0. And you can see that in the diagram on the right here. So called a step function because of the step up to 0, up to 1, sorry, at the origin. Before we finish, I'd like to give a quick introduction to systems. Since the series is loosely based on a signals and systems course, it's important that we also look into the notation of systems. A system is a process that produces an output signal in response to an input signal. 
A system is often denoted as a rectangular box like we see at the top here. It has some input, x of n, and some output, y of n. On the box here, I've written capital H. This is something that you'll commonly see. Um, when I said H was often used for the frequency domain, capital H is uh, what we use to denote the frequency response commonly. And we'll see why we might label a system with capital H further down the line. Before we get into that and to finish off today, I'd like to introduce the idea of linear time invariant systems. This is something you'll come across in DSP a lot. And today I'm just going to go over what the properties are of a linear system. So what needs to be in place for us to call a system linear? And then next time we'll have a look at time invariance. So the first property that we need to have for a system to be called linear is homogeneity. A system is said to be homogeneous if an amplitude change in the input produces an identical amplitude change in the output. That is, if an input signal x of n produces an output y of n, then an input signal scaled by some scaling factor k should produce an output y of n scaled by an identical factor k. The second property we have to have for linearity is additivity. A system is said to be additive if when two or more input signals are added, they pass through the system without interfering with each other. That is, if an input signal x1 of n produces an output signal y1 of n, and an input signal x2 of n produces an output signal y2 of n. If we add x1 of n with x2 of n and feed it as an input into a system, we want to receive the output y1 of n plus y2 of n. This might be a lot to take in at first if you're new to this, but just remember this is about preservation. We want to preserve the scaling that we do to x of n in the output, and we want to preserve the addition of x1 of n and x2 of n in the output. Thanks so much for joining me for the first episode of DSP Corner. Um, yeah, I'd like to continue the conversation over in the Discord channel. If you haven't joined already, that's over at the audioprogrammer.com forward slash Discord. And yeah, catch you all over there soon. Thank you very much, Rachel. I've learned a lot there. And uh, right. yeah, this is really fantastic. And um, <laughs> I'm really proud. I'm really proud to have this uh, as part of our monthly, uh, our monthly meetup. I think a lot of people are going to, uh, to find this very useful, not only um, in the meetup as we do them, but also when we when we cut the videos down afterwards and uh, have them as just digestible uh, little chunks of uh, of lessons in uh, in their own playlist on the channel. So uh, thank you very much, Rachel.